Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Wednesday Bible study. Uh, we are on Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Uh, it's good to be here with you guys all. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces in the chat. Um, and uh, so, Renee, I also have Renee with us tonight. Renee, do you want to say hi to everyone? Hey, everybody. I'm just doing audio tonight because I got the light off back here. So I'm in, uh, looking forward to the fellowship tonight, the Bible study. Um, again, if you have a comment or question in regards to the verses tonight, uh, put them in the chat and we are happy to discuss them as we go along. And I would also ask that you keep Brother Luke in prayer still, please. Yeah, definitely. Uh, looks like Luke gave us an update in chat about his uh, current uh, state of recovery. Um, it's good to hear that, uh, yeah, okay, he says he's not feeling better. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, he's gonna have a turnaround here. I trust that he will. Um, so yeah, we are on chapter, uh, Ephesians 5, chapter verse 14. And uh, if we wanna go ahead and get started, uh, we will start with the KJV and, uh, I'll go ahead and read it, Renee. The first, um, the first uh, section here. Uh, okay, so we we read previously. Let me just kind of summarize what we read previously. Uh, so we're talking about uh, in, in previous in chapter five, Paul was uh, admonishing these believers to not walk as they once did in darkness, uh, like the other Gentiles, um, who you again basically gave them over themselves over to. Uh, to what with what their flesh wanted to wanted they and so I think God kind of allowed I think when God I don't know what your perspective is on this Renee but I don't like when Romans where it says like for example that God gave them over to a a depraved mind or actually I really don't like that word depraved mind or reprobate mind because it really means um, reprobate sounds like it's a, it I think it's abused and misused it really just means if you look at it, it means simply means uh, disapproved. Because they because they didn't approve of God, God gave them over to a disapproved mind, and uh, what, the way I kind of see that is that they had a disapproved mind. They, their mind didn't approve of the knowledge of God. They didn't think it was worthwhile to retain. So uh, I think God basically lifted the societal uh, roadblocks that kept them from engaging in that sin, or you know, uh, for it for it to become societally accepted. And so a lot of the sins that the Gentiles wanted to do, God uh, again allowed. We, we know that God appoints people, uh, it says also in Romans, he appoints the government so that uh, it, it can punish the evildoers, essentially. And when those people are don't, don't longer no longer enforce the law or, or enforce certain laws, um, I, I, I can see it where that's how God allows people to kind of, you know, you don't want you don't like my way. So I'll allow, allow, allow you to uh, go ahead and have it your way and see where that gets you. Um, right. And. I, I think that's basically what Paul, Paul's saying uh, in in Romans, uh, sorry, Ephesians five, where it says, "Don't we don't, you know, you you were in darkness. The the the, the surrounding culture was uh, pr wicked, and give themselves over to uh, you know, all this foolish talking and fil filthiness and uh, a covetousness and uncleanness and fornication." That Paul said, but he's saying you shouldn't walk like that anymore because you were once in darkness, but you yep. are no longer, and yep. so. For that reason, uh, we shouldn't have any fellowship with the um, unfruitful deeds of darkness. Yep. And so that brings up brings us up to uh, verse 14. And verse 14 says, uh, Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And that is actually uh, quoted uh, a number of times in Isaiah. Um I think it's. It looks like it's in. Uh, I well, it's it's explicitly ver word for word in Isaiah nine two, but it's also alluded elsewhere in Isaiah, and one of the the context there is basically uh, the the Israel needed to wake up from their slumber. Essentially, uh, they were completely had gone completely astray. Uh, they were essentially walking in darkness, and so God tells them to wake up, and and even in Isaiah, the context also is that. You need to wake up so you could be a light to the Gentiles, because the Gentiles will will, will, uh, will be drawn to you through, to your light, and and you let your you've snuffed out your light essentially, 
And I think that's what Paul's kind of saying here is, is that you don't walk in darkness anymore. Don't walk uh, foolish as you once did. Don't be like, uh, don't, you know, don't, don't walk in the, in the ways that you previously did. Otherwise your light can't shine and you will not be a good witness to other, uh, other people. And you'll bring reproach, not only on the church, but uh, Christ himself. And so he's, it's a, almost like a call to action, I believe, is that, okay, because you were, you're no longer dead, you're no longer dead, you're trespassed in sins, you're no longer sons of, de of darkness, um, you're sons of light, walk, walk, uh, walk like this, you do conduct yourselves in ways that are fitting for saints. And, um, and so it's essentially the call to action is to live in Christ's resurrection power as what? he, uh, as you allow the word, um, to, uh, it, 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 as, 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 you, as you allow the word to light your path, essentially, um, and that's you know that's kind of in keeping with the idea of um, have nothing to do with the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather reprove them. Yep, couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean the very beginning of the chapter says, "Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children." So, uh, unfortunately, so many take these exhortations and instructions on what saved people are supposed to do and, and make them uh, qualif qualifiers for salvation, which is completely wrong. Um, and yeah, I, you're right. It is mentioned Isaiah nine, but it's also mentioned Isaiah 51, Isaiah 60 and uh, Malachi also has something similar, similar message anyway. Uh, if we, all right. So we'll go back to, a couple of verses it says proving what is acceptable unto the Lord have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them for it's a shame even to speak of those things, which are done of them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. So, uh, it's the light of the word and walking in the truth. Our, our good behavior will also shine upon the darkness to show it for the darkness it is. And the light of God's word uh, actually exposes it clearly as darkness. So uh, when it goes on from there, uh, he's absolutely right. Um, it says that we are he that is dead. It is we're free from sin. So we're supposed to reckon that we literally died. Our flesh, our old man died with Jesus at the crucifixion. So we should walk in newness of life and that is in what been called resurrection power in our life so the verse here in 14 when it says wherefore wherefore what because you know uh whatever does make manifest is light wherefore he saith awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and christ shall give thee light and he's using an old testament thing here like you said the uh, context there was to wake them up out of their slumber, uh, which he calls them uh, dead, you know. Um, and let, let's go over to Isaiah 51. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. So, hey, this, uh, this chastisement of God was a wake-up call. That's what that verse is saying. Isaiah 60, verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. It's again showing uh, references to uh, being asleep or dead and God's light shining. Whereas in Isaiah 51, is saying, Awake, stand up, because you've taken the cup of his fear. You're, this should be a wake-up call to you. If you go over to Malachi 4.2, it says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. This is interesting because the S-U-N, Son, is capitalized, but I believe the S-U-N is the S-O-N, even though it's spelled sun like sun in the sky. Unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. The sun in the sky is not a he. I believe that sun is supposed to be the sun. Arise with healing in his wings. And we know that that's referring to Jesus 
because the woman that was had an ailment for all those years, an issue of blood, reached out to touch the wings of his garment because of this passage that the Savior, the Messiah, would have healing in his wings. So uh, she knew this verse and took it literally, and her faith saved her, if you remember. He asked everyone, hey, who touched me? He's like, what do you mean who touched you? You're in the middle of a press. Everybody's touching you. And he said, I felt virtue go out of me. Uh, this is a picture of that. So Paul is using the concept in the Old Testament, like Ben was showing you in Isaiah 9. He uses it in a couple of places uh, to show, yes, uh, he's shaking them up. So he's using an Old Testament concept uh, in the New Testament to say, look, the, these things were uh, can can apply to us today. And like, like you said, Ben, it's a, a reference to God's people. These are already saved people. Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. Yeah, yeah another, so, um, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, you're right. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just, just going to mention um, another, another, again, Isaiah, again, uh, uh, that's applicable here. And that this is, is in, with what you just said, plus what I was mentioning about uh, the, the the fact that the, the Israel's uh, uh, Israel was supposed to be a light to the world, a lamp to the world, and uh, they, they yet they had fallen asleep. And in Isaiah fifty two one it says, "Awake, awake! Put on your strength, O Zion! Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised Gentiles and the unclean." shall no longer come to you um so if you don't wake wake up essentially um your light is gonna you're not, you're not gonna have a light you're, you're not gonna be a light to the world like we're all supposed to be right um and, and that in that sense we're supposed to uh be be spiritually awake and oh you know alive yeah i agree with everything you said there in the, in your original statements as well i think it was really good clear also, too, is that uh, I know, uh, you know, Paul said in Romans uh, 16, verse 19, he says, I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Um, so, again, we're, we're going to touch on, it looks like Paul's going to touch on uh, the, you know, walking, walking in the word, the wisdom of the word. Um, and I just saw a parallel there that, uh, again, we're not supposed to walk like we once did, not, not conforming to our former lusts. You know, it says former lusts too. It doesn't mean that you don't you don't still have those lusts. It just basically means don't walk in the old man. That's the way I, I kind of interpret that. Okay, uh, so we covered verse fourteen. Um, uh, how about uh, we'll, we'll uh, do uh, fifteen and sixteen? It says, "See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil." I don't know if you want to cover that one first, Renee. All right. Hold on. No problem. I can go if you want. All right. Let's see. Uh, all right. So see that you walk circumspectly or which cautiously with care. Uh, see that you take care in your walk. Not as fools, but as wise. You were saying that earlier. Uh, there's wisdom. He's saying that uh, it's foolish to walk the ways you used to walk when you were in darkness. Why would you continue walking in darkness when you are in the light now? Uh, or at least walking like those that are still in the darkness. We're told many times, do not walk as they do. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil and i think that's uh could be a reference to you know paul didn't know when the end times were coming but just like john he thought they were right around the corner and so the the challenge was get the gospel out to every creature because time is short and he knew that the that the world was going to wax worse and worse it wasn't going to get better redeeming the time because the days are evil and i think that is a reference uh, not just to using our own personal time, our lives are short to use it, but uh, to because the world itself is going to get worse and the days are evil 
and we should be cautious and, and it's foolish to walk around and act like those that are unsaved to, to do the things that they do that we shouldn't even it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done to them in secret uh so this is all of this is confirming hey you're children of god you haven't learned you haven't learned from christ to act this way so don't act this way you know how your father uh wants you to be so uh it's foolish to not uh heed his commands you know to not walk in the identity that he says we are in Christ. Right. And yeah, I mean, that's one something that's really been, um, really become uh, uh, relevant to me or, or uh, particularly poignant to me, I guess, recently is just redeeming the time. Uh, as the older I get, the time just flies by quicker and quicker and faster and faster. And it, it just it, it, it just gets away from me. It's like I don't know where it went. And it's become increasingly uh, uh, obvious to me that uh, I, I really do. I mean, I, in light of eternity, I need to be spending my time wisely. There's so many things that distract us to want to get our attention. Even even uh, things that we might be considered good, like something a, a fellow believer wants you to look into this or look into that. You know, it's like, okay, well, I, I need to stay focused on what I'm looking what I, you know— I think it's important that we we set our own agenda too. You know, uh, God certainly uh, works with us, and uh, you know has us on a, on a path. But a lot of believers might want to, you know, even even if it's not necessarily bad. But hey, if you look at this or look at that, and it's like, okay, I, I, yeah, I get I get over after after a while, I get there's a conspiracy in the world. I know there's a, a lot of conspiracies, but they're not uh, beneficial to for me to know much more than I already know about it. So in that sense, it's important. I think we need for us to be um um wise about what is good and uh uh simple with regards to what is evil with we you know we know something evil and we don't need to study it and uh constantly uh look at how how deep the rabbit hole goes we don't go quite deep and um and yet you know it, it, it even though it, it, we can expose evil it we're not supposed to expose evil for the sake of exposing evil we're supposed to expose evil so it doesn't uh affect our walk and so I think it's important that we stay, again, focused on what is good and redeeming the time always um, because the days are evil. Uh, I think, I don't, I, I don't, you know, I, I know, I'm sure the days are way more, yeah, I remember when I first saw that the days are evil, like, well, I don't think really seem that bad to me. I mean, the world doesn't seem that bad. This again, when I was first saved, uh, the world doesn't seem that bad to me. But then you start realizing, you start allowing the, the word of God expose that evil and you, yeah. it, beco it becomes very clear to you. Yes. There's a lot of evil going on, not just on, on the surface, but even under the surface. Uh, yeah. but even some of the stuff that we're, we know about, um, you know, just think about wars in general and you know, wars, I can't believe it, it's unfathomable that, that wars go on and that people would voluntarily go to war and, uh, or not even necessarily voluntarily, but be forced to go into war. I mean, that to me, it's just like, it's unfathomable, you know, it's just, it, that's, it, that's all you need to know. I'm sorry, go ahead. Even, even entertainment. Right. Yes. Yes. Glorify it. Glorify it. Slaughtering little babies in the womb, partial birth abortions now. Right. Yep. By the millions. Right. And, and even you got, yeah, it, it, Islam slaughtering people, North Korea slaughtering people. Right. Just the corruption too. All the, just everywhere where it's corrupt. All the things that you trusted at one point, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things like you trusted like science or you trusted the medical industry or whatever it may be, and you just realize now that you're just a product and you're just uh, yeah. you're nothing. You're nothing to them. And people people lie just to save face and to make it look like they know something when they don't. Um, yep. And I'm so glad God rescued me from that because. Um, and, and, and how he rescued me, with me was through his word. And that's why I think it's so important to stay abiding in that word so that you don't, again, uh, you, you won't be led astray or even just sink back into your own flesh, which is so easy to do. Sure. Sure. Uh, Hendrix asked, um, I think you, you already discussed it, but it said, so panel, would you say that what we do now can redeem the time and be of significance to God? That we aren't resisting evil in vain. Uh, you know, 
I, I don't believe in social justice uh, warriors. <laughs> like, uh, that's Satan's kingdom. Now, we are supposed to speak up against things when the world's doing overtly evil things. Yes, we are. We're supposed to stand our ground and say, hey, it's evil. We're going to call evil evil, flat out. But we know that this world's corrupt and it's going to stay corrupt till the Lord comes. Our main focus is to preach the gospel because no change comes until the Holy Spirit dwells inside a person. Nothing that the heart and the mind cannot change. The mind cannot uh, begin to transform until uh, the spirit dwells within a person. So our primary uh, motivation and commandment is to preach the gospel to every creature. And then, of course, as Christians, we are to call things out as evil and expose them. Right. But again, uh, Paul talks about, you know, what, what are we to judge those without the church? What, what are we doing judging people outside the church? We deal with people inside the church. That's what we deal with as far as behavior goes. But when we see something in society that is wicked, yes, we stand up and say it's evil. And then we only ask our people not to partake in it. Because we have nothing to do with those without the church. Uh, the system and governments and laws were set up to contain the evil outside the church. That's what the Bible says. The governments and everything were set up for the positions of authority was to give order and to keep evil men from wreaking havoc on all of us. And that's what those things are for. Uh, see, a lot of Christians get sidetracked with all the social justice warrior stuff. They think they're going to change the world and bring the kingdom now and all this mess when they should be preaching the gospel speaking against evil when it's present, but only dealing with the behavior of those within the church. Those outside the church, without the church, are in the hands of God and are in the hands of uh, these ordained uh, positions uh, of government and law and things that God set up. It says that the law was not made for a righteous man, but the unrighteous. You know, it's to so that there can be some structure and to keep evil men from overtaking everything. So, um, yeah, we got to be careful with that, I believe. You know, the, the key here is getting people saved and in God's kingdom. Uh, it doesn't matter if you try to change Satan's kingdom. So what if they clean up this or that behavior? It's, it's not helping anybody. Uh, but we do speak up against it. We we call it evil. We say what it is is evil. Uh, but nowadays they call evil good. And if we call if we're saying it's evil, they're saying we're evil for calling evil evil. We're intolerant. We're unloving. We don't want to give people freedom of choice, woman's right, or whatever. Uh, so they're calling evil good good evil. So uh, as Christians, we can only expose it. Um, but it is not our job to change the outside world and what they're doing, right? Uh, we should vote appropriately. We should take a stand when evil things are being done. But so, I, I think a lot of people get sidetracked trying to deal with what Satan's kingdom is doing instead of getting people saved and bringing them into God's kingdom. I, I hope that made sense. Perfect sense. That was beautiful. I, I totally, totally agree. Yeah, I don't think God wants us involved in social justice initiatives that are, are again, they have nothing, you know, those people, are, let the dead do, let the dead bury the dead, as, as Christ said. Let let the lost people do what a lost person will do, and let uh, let a saved man do what only a saved man can do, which is uh, manifest the spirit, preach the gospel, etc. Um, okay, so I'm going to go down to the next verse here. Um, and so we could see here. Okay, yes, yeah, so we said verse. So starting with verse sixteen, or sorry, uh, verse seventeen, uh, says, "Where wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is." Uh, and I'll actually read the next verse too. It says, "And be not drunk with wine, wherein wherein is excess, but be fit, be but be filled with the Holy Spirit." And so, um, 
uh, obviously the you know wisdom uh, as people have said so many times uh i know renee you've said it a number of times i heard luke say it a number of times and it's so true is that wisdom is not merely knowledge it's it's knowing uh how to apply that that knowledge how to apply it so you could be full and fat of, of, of knowledge but uh still not like a lot of people are, are full of the of the bible they know a lot of it they don't understand it they don't want to apply it and uh they don't even understand the gospel so in that sense they're kind of fattening themselves up for the day of slaughter unfortunately unless they unless they uh again uh, realize that allow the law to uh do its work and bring them to utter uh desperation that they you know they have nothing to offer god whatsoever and they're just as, as much as a sinner as anyone else um but applying that knowledge is, is important and uh you know obviously god's wisdom is his word and so the more that we study his word and look to apply it um the more uh the more wise we will become and the more the more we are able to walk circumspectly or carefully as paul said and uh you know so so understanding what the word of the lord is we know that you know we're we're we we as believers are supposed to operate on grace principles, and grace principles basically means you know when someone, uh, you know we're supposed to turn the other cheek, give them the other cheek. Uh, you know, Proverbs says a soft answer answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Well, if you want to, you know, if you want to avoid conflict with unbelievers and things like that, well, don't be, don't return evil for evil. Uh, you know, be gracious to them. That's 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 a law. <laughs> it's a law that we're supposed to live by. Be gracious. And, and again, not a law, but for salvation, but in a, a, a way we're supposed to conduct ourselves. The law says, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, um, where, where the recompense, you always recompense what was, uh, you know, whatever the offense, someone, however someone offended you, you basically uh, return it back in kind. Whereas grace says, no, you give you give them what they don't deserve, uh, which is grace, which what we all don't deserve. We don't, we don't deserve grace, but that's what God gave us and his son and what he did for us and so uh you know that's wisdom proverbs is actually a, it's a book of wisdom and again that that is wisdom applied right there is that if you want to avoid conflict i i use this, these kind of principles in my daily life where i did find that uh you know people were being condescending to me so i'd be condescending right back to them and it got it would get ugly it would get uh it got ugly. It just got ugly. It had, it caused more problems. Whereas when I realized, you know what, I just take it. I just take it. You know, I know they're in error, um, and so I'll, I'll accept it and and I'll I'll return. Uh, uh, you know, I'll take their hate and return love, and it it resolved a lot of uh, problems for me. For example, uh, just makes my relations with uh, the outside world just more just more just, it's more more smoother. So much less drama. Um, and I don't get caught up in that stuff anymore. And so in that sense, um, again, I think that's how, you know, and that, and that's one way we can apply and know what God's will is, is to work by grace, operate ourselves on grace principles. Um, that's uh, to me is, is wisdom and knowledge of God applied it, for it as a, just a simple example. Um, but also too, you know, um, it says, don't be, um, don't be drunk with wine, uh, where there is dissipation. Uh, but be filled with, with the spirit. And so if you think of drunkenness, it's really a, a cheap substitute for the real thing that we all have, which is the Holy Spirit. And, you know, as a, as a again, new believer, I found that I found that very, um, it took me back because I used to, I didn't, I never really drank very much. Uh, I never, as a, as a, as a young man, I, I didn't really drink often, but when I did, I always did excess, uh, and I, I had a control problem with it. That's why I don't. That's why I personally don't drink at all. Because I, when I, it, for me, when I start, it's hard for me to stop. Uh, and, and pretty much everything I've ever regretted in my whole life had to, alcohol was involved. Um, and when I remember reading that verse, it's like, okay, well, uh, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It was like, okay, well, how do I do that? And and how is that? How is that uh, related to drunkenness? Uh, you know, people do drink to, to, to make their problems go away, to, to seek comfort. They think you're going to get joy from it. Um, and it's going to soothe, basically soothe their spirit. Uh, but I think there's a verse in the Bible that says something like the, the, the poison of wine is like an adder or something. Uh, it's, it's like a, it's like venom. And so when you, when you wake up, we wake up the next morning, you got a massive hangover. It does feel like you've been bit by a snake. 
and I, I you do feel you do feel like you've been uh oh, it's just it's a terrible feeling uh and i know that feeling all too well thankfully it hasn't happened in a long time but uh i i, I thought okay well i could replace that with the holy spirit well how do i do that what's well, funny to me now because uh when I do abide in God's word, especially for an extended period of time, and when I feel like he's showing me things, uh, you know, just how to understand the word better, it's an incredible high. In fact, I, I've I've texted people uh, in the middle of the night sometimes and just, you know, just being uh, with a, just being elated and uh, and basically high on Jesus and of what I discovered and what he's shown me. I just get so high from it. I have to, show, I have to share it with people. And I think probably sometimes I've, you know, people thought, Who, what, what's up with him? He's kind of, he, you know, uh, he, something, something's not right with him. Uh, but that, that I'm okay with that because, um, again, I was kind of, I was high on the Holy Spirit at the time. And there's even things I put on Facebook and the next day would say, who is that guy? Who, you know, it's like, I, I, I feel kind of embarrassed because I, I slip the next day I'm back in my flesh and I'm, and I'm seeing myself posting something on Facebook when I was in the spirit. And it was like, it, it was like, for example, when, May, when, uh, Elizabeth saw Jesus or Mary and said uh, to him, you know, she spoke out with a loud voice, said, uh, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. You know, she just kind of belted it out, you know, and uh, I do find that it happens periodically. And um, and you look back on it, it's like, wow, that, it's almost like you're drunk, but you're not. You know, there's no hangover. It's actually a, a good thing. Um, but uh, you definitely can uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is, uh, it's the greatest high um that you know, you can't get by any other sub by any substance on this earth she wasn't visibly pregnant there was no way elizabeth would have known except the holy spirit wow good point good point where i mean if you look at it elizabeth was six months that means she was only a, a couple of weeks pregnant right she would not have been uh, visible Right. So that was obviously the Holy Spirit prophesying to her. Right. And I, and I feel like, again, like, but sometimes when I get filled with the Holy Spirit, I get that way too. It's like I just, uh, have, I say things and it, it's like, you know, you, you want to sing, you want to dance, you want to dance in the Holy Spirit, you want to celebrate, you know. And I, and for me, I'm not that kind of, in my, by default, without the Holy Spirit, I'm not like that person, that person at all. I'm kind of very cynical, uh, very, uh, I'm just like a kind of an Eeyore type of guy sometimes. Um, but um, when I do get filled with the Holy Spirit, it does, um, it's, you're, you're being, you're acting out in the new man. You're not in the old man anymore. And I think that's what Paul's trying to say here. Don't, you know, drunkenness is going to only, um, it brings about debauchery. It, 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 uh, it, uh, it basically makes the old man drunk, essentially. And so why be that way? When God give you something much better, um, which is the Holy Spirit, and um, it, it's much better. I don't know if you, if you have any experience with that. or Yeah, I, I've actually said things that I've never said before. Like uh, I'll, we'll be discussing scripture or something, and I will say something I did not know I knew. Right. Or I will say something on a verse that I never saw. Like I, and then I'll go, what? I said that. And I'll right. go back. I don't know where that came from. Like I've, I've had that happen before. Yes. Yes. You know? Yeah. I'll see things in scripture. They'll become like 3d. Um, yep. Like for example, um, a recent, a recent example, I was out walking my dog and I was looking at revelation 22 at the very end of it, very end of the book. And, uh, you know, where it says, uh, the spirit and the bride say, come, whoever, uh, thirsts, uh, let them take freely of the water of life. But then underneath it, it's cursed. There's cursing. Like, but anyone who adds these things, uh, God will add to the plagues. Anyone who, who uh, uh, removes or takes away from the word, God will take away his part in the, in the, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Harsh opposites. Yeah. Yeah. And when, I, when it came to me, it's like, I, I, it's like, I, I just came, it came 3D to me. Like, oh, I see. It's this, it's almost like a, it's, it's, it's a spiritual boundary stone in the old, in the ancient world, uh, they had boundary stones and the, like, for, like, for example, Pharaoh would grant his sons or people in his family, uh, privileged positions 
to co co rule with him, and so he'd grant a piece of land, for example, and he would on that on that on the boundary of that land, he would put a, a stone, and it would say basically on the top of the stone, above. Above the curses, uh, on the top of the stone would be the promise, and, and it basically says, "Okay, hey, I'm giving this to such and such. He's my son. Uh, this is my gracious gift to him." And then underneath it, it would he would inv they would invoke the curses of the gods to say, "Okay, if any outside outsider, again, he's granting the land to an insider, someone that's in the family, so to speak, like we're sons of God, uh, which is what Revelation is inviting you to become. The spirit and the bride say, "Come, be a." Be part of the spirit of, of God. Be part of the bride. Come with us. But anyone who do, who fails to take that invitation is an outsider. And as an outsider, um, underneath that promise, it was uh, they would again invoke the curses of anyone who tried to interfere with the terms of that of that grant. Uh, it's like it, so. It's a covenantal term. Like this is an unconditional promise. But anyone who tries to who you know is not a, a child of promise is by default a child of of the curse essentially and so they would invoke the curses of the gods underneath it and that's exactly what hap is i believe what you're seeing it's at the very end of the bible the very last verse verses it's about i think it's like a spiritual boundary stone where god's saying come come but if you remain oh. outside then um then you you are subject to the law and the law says if you add to the word you know again a believer you could tamper with God's word. I'm, I'm not saying, suggesting anyone do that whatsoever, but uh, but uh, for certainly, you know, God forbid anyone ever do that. But uh, again, if a believer did that accidentally or even purposely, it's not gonna, it doesn't affect their salvation whatsoever. But as an unbeliever, that could be held against them. And so it's like it's a law to outsiders saying, don't try to interfere with this this covenant of grace. Uh, if you do. Um, well, then you be sub you you become subject to the curse. Um, to... Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. no. Nope. Uh, I was gonna say two of the strongest times were like when my breath was taken away. One was simply the ram uh, with Abraham caught in the in the thorns by his horns, and I I literally that's Jesus's crown of thorns. It came to me. That's the crown of thorns. It's a picture of the crown of thorns jesus would wear the ram uh the male sacrifice uh caught in the thorn brush right, right. right. and it i wasn't thinking about it it just a picture flashed in my mind and it like took my breath because i knew it wasn't something i was consciously seeking or figuring out this was years ago right and uh the the um other one was one day i was driving in the car and it hit me uh the story of gomer in the old testament hit me about how god loves us so much and he's so faithful that even when his wife is a prostitute he goes back and buys her again like he he never leaves us it's it's his faithfulness that keeps us you know and so the whole story of that, um, you know, the man, the prophet being told to go buy his wife back again off the prostitution block was uh, pretty breathtaking to me as well. You know, with the uh, the, the, the um, ram caught in the thicket, you know, the, one of the things in the Bible, there's a lot of things that they're known as polemics, which basically is a uh, it's almost like a, a mockery of the yes. of the guy of the of. of little g gods so a lot of the plagues in egypt were a, a polemic against the oh, egyptian gods oh yeah yeah, the, yeah you want to worship frogs here you go right right <laughs> and with that, with that ram caught in the thicket if you if you look at it um back in uh i think they found this in in, in ur uh, of the chaldees uh, they found a, a it's a golden it's a it, they worship the ram as a god and there's a sure. there's a ram um in in a uh, in a thicket essentially and i think that 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 whole story with isaac is also a polemic against that god uh, oh very powerful yeah it's it's amazing um that, you know, somebody worship the four-footed beast and the creeping things yes yep yeah it's very it's 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 really shocking um you know again we're not in darkness anymore i'm sorry go ahead. They, they worship the mythical uh worship those like apis bulls 
Yes. You know, and they have the little uh, moon and then the star. You still see that same sign on, well, with Islam. And, uh, you know, they would kill a bull and take a bath under the blood. They would kill one and the blood would fall over them. They'd dig a pit. It was really, really grotesque, the worshiping of these animals. Yeah, I just one thing I'm, I'm discovering is that so many ancient religions, when it comes down to it, there's so much, it's always a common theme of moon worship the most ancient of them uh yeah and, and they all have you know they they have they, yeah, manifested in various ways but they're all if you kind of trace it all back it really kind of goes back to the moon yeah one thing yeah. I, I i discovered a couple of days ago i thought it was fascinating is that in the old testament i didn't know this until recently in the old testament you if you got divorced um you you could get divorced if for marital you know, it was okay to get divorced, so to speak. It was a concession that Moses gave uh, to get divorced based on uh, infidelity or right. sexual immorality. But even even if the husband want, after that divorce occurred, they could not. The husband and wife could not get remarried again. It was considered a defilement. And so, even if even if the, you know they reconciled and said, okay, well, you know, we love each other, we want to get back married again, they couldn't under the law. It was considered a defilement. And uh, I think that's part of what what uh, Hebrews is talking about too, as well, is that they they were married to the law, but now they became married to Christ, and now they wanted to go back to, to being married to the law right. again, and it was a defilement. Um, it yeah. was like you could not do that. Um, and I wonder if that's why he says, "Lest any um, one among you become profane like Esau, like profane like, um, or I'm sorry, fornicator like Esau." I, you know, like it's like he wanted to go back to the law. It, it, it was a spiritual fornication. I don't know, but um, just just move for thought. Okay, where do we leave off? Verse. Um, All right. Yeah, I gotta go. T I gotta do the verses you just did. Okay, go ahead. The one you stopped it drunk with wine, right? 18? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Seventeen and eighteen. Wherefore be ye not unwise? And, and again, this makes your first point. The whole point is, don't be stupid. You know, you're, you're children of God now. Don't be unwise. Think on your circumspectly. Cautiously think of all the things before you make a decision. And he calls them not as fools, but as wise. And again, he says, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not and what what is his will that all his children be followers of him, like it says, as dear children. Uh, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Yeah, um, and that you know, that's how we got on this conversation. Uh, you know, a lot of people take this too far and say you can't you're not even allowed to even drink wine at all what i think that people just take stuff so far and make it legalistic you know he didn't say you can't enjoy a glass of wine he said don't get drunk don't get drunk with wine we're supposed to find uh our joy uh from the lord so if you're going to be filled with something it shouldn't be alcohol it should be with the spirit that's all He's giving them like an alternative. Hey, don't do this, but do this. Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. You know, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the spirit. So it's like, don't do this, but do that. Uh, it's just, a, if you look at it, it's just how he's speaking. Do you notice that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, because you're not this anymore, and you you are this. Conduct yourself cord accordingly. You know. Right. Um, right. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I think yeah, like drunkenness is like a cheap substitute. They call drunkenness. They call them spirits, <laughs> and um, it's a cheap substitute for the real thing. That what 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 we're really supposed to be felt. What God designed us to be filled with, which is His Spirit. Um, and with with drunkenness, it leads. It, it has. You know, on the surface, it may it may seem like it's bring joy and peace and happiness, and with a little bit, that's a, a little a little bit of wine can can do that. Um, but too much, uh, you know, to be filled with it, uh, definitely it doesn't bring that. It it, it comes it it just like in law or a sin, it it deceives 
and it uh, it comes back to bite you. Um, whereas the Holy Spirit, you don't get any of that. You don't get any of the negative side effects. There's, it's all good. And then also he, he says, uh, you may go ahead with verse 19. Yeah, I want to address this alcohol okay, thing real quick. Y'all, sure. y'all, please hear me on this. I'm not promoting drinking, nor am I condemning anyone because they have a drink. I'm asking people to use common sense and as the Lord leads, uh, because when we get legalistic on this, sometimes forbidden things become sweet to us. But the fact that you, you could have it, it's like, eh, I don't want it. It's just, we, we have to have a, a, a mind of self-control. In all things moderation, self-control. Uh, I don't think we should go too extreme with anything except our love for God. And so if if you feel the Lord is telling you, don't drink alcohol because others might see you drink and it'll hurt your testimony, don't drink. If you feel uh, that you could have a glass of wine at dinner and that would actually, hey, they might feel more comfortable with me at dinner if they're drinking wine and I have a glass. That's fine too. Uh, my motivation is I, I don't care if you drink or not. It's none of my business what you do. I'm only saying we we don't want to take these things so far in either direction to where we make somebody a judgmental, uh, legalistic person. That is not where we're coming from. That's That's not gonna bring anybody close to God, I don't think. Again, it's it's everybody's uh own walk. You know, not all all things are expe uh, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. And if so if alcohol has power over you, then don't drink it if you have a specific issue. I just saw the the conversation started to go that way. Well I'm I don't drink. I feel it's not okay that's that's fine. You you don't I'm trying to be clear here that because my words are so often twisted that I want to be clear that I'm not telling anyone to do either. It's just the Bible's clear. We're not supposed to get drunk. It doesn't say you can't have a glass of wine if you want one. So I don't want anybody thinking I'm I'm going either way on that. Yeah, that, Sorry. I hope I didn't come that way off that way either. I per, I was saying I personally I uh, abstain because I do have a problem with it. Um, yeah, my- and so that's why I personally, uh, it also, a lot of people too won't realize it, but a lot of medications people take interact with it. And, um, and it can, you know, you can get drunk with very little and not even realize yeah, it. I don't, I don't drink because of all the meds I'm on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do we want to go to verse 19 and. Yes, I'm, sir. I'm, okay. So I'm going to, uh, okay. So I'll talk about, uh, I'll do 19 and 20. It says, speaking to, so it says, after, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And verse 19, Paul writes, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, I, I wish I was a more, I, I, it doesn't, I know it by just necessarily mean, um, you know, it, it basically means it's in this, you know, well, well, I, so I think it's good that we do sing. I'm not one to sing out loud and, and publicly, personally, but I wish I was. Um, but again, it's making a melody in your heart. So it's really uh, having a song in your heart, um, a song in your spirit. Um, we, you know, we all have those, I think we all have those times, not always. I'm not saying the Christian walk is, is always, uh, you know, like walking on sunshine, but there are times when it is. Uh, where you feel like you're walking, you know, you're you're uh, weightless, um, and uh, and I think when we do have those times, we need to, if we can, you know, it, it, to share it with other people because th- some people are not. Uh, we can lift other other people up with that, um, and so uh, again, I, I think it's important that uh, that we do share our joy with one another because sometimes people are feeling down or they're feeling depressed, and if they can. That they are reminded of the love of God and see that the that the love what God's doing in your life and and how He's working in you, that could be a tremendous uh, uh, 
a boost or edification for our fellow believers. Um, and you know, it, it, and for me, it's sometimes like I, I've, I've definitely feel this way sometimes a lot. It's like, I, I don't mean to sound corny. I, it's like, I found even corny saying it, but I shouldn't, but I do have a lot of love in my heart and I do want to, it's overflowing sometimes and I want to express it and I want to, I want to share it somehow. Um, and I think sometimes a lot of other believers are put off by that a little bit, like, oh well, no, that's a little creepy. You're you're at you're too interested in me, or you're uh, you're too interested in taking care of me, or uh, you know, this doesn't. I don't know. They, they're suspicious, and I, I think we sometimes. Uh, I think it's a good reason, we, especially when we're, when we're on the internet. It is important to be somewhat suspicious of one another, but um, at the same time. Uh, be willing to receive uh, one another's love. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a lot of people that not only uh, is there not often enough love expressed by Christians, but when it is, it's often not received. So um, that would be one uh, exhortation I would have for tonight. Um, I don't know. What do you think about those verses, Renee? Sorry, I had to get my little... Sure. Not here. Yeah, we're, we'll go up ahead again and read it all together. Okay. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you stopped at 20, I believe, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh it's Paul really has these run on sentences with a lot of semicolons, but <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, he's, he's telling us to be followers of God, to not be foolish, to walk wisely, uh, to not get drunk. And so he's, he's also reminding us to have joy uh, one with another uh, as we praise God and to, always have a heart of thanksgiving and i i it's one of the things i think a lot of christians are without and that is anytime there's a problem and we all have problems they forget all the things they should be grateful for you know i i i don't care how much your life has been stripped you can find things i told you i i was so spiritually emotionally financially bankrupt no health no career nothing no home even and i was thanking god for cold water you know thanking him for creation and how beautiful it was i, I was finding things that i could have genuine gratitude in my heart because i was in so much pain over all the loss so we should always begin our prayers with gratitude and thanks to god and it, we're told that several places in scripture. And I think partly that is for us as well, because having this attitude of gratitude is a really good place to be, um, as well as reminding us what God does for us daily that we take for granted, you know, uh, as his children, but just the things that God gives even the lost that are taken for granted every day. And as a child, we should thank our father for the thing so that he can hear our, our how, how we do appreciate him. You know, I mean, God is not needy. He doesn't need anything from us, but we are his children. And I imagine it would probably touch his heart that we acknowledge these things. I would think so if my child came to me and and thanked me for some of the little things that I do, you know, it would feel really good. And and so uh, it seems here that Paul is uh, not saying that just just telling us to praise the Lord and uh, to show God the joy we have because He's our God and He's our Father, but also uh, to each other. And it's it's a it's a replacement for the being drunk with wine. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's a real joy, a real festivity, not one of the flesh like drunkenness. Okay, excellent. Um, 
and so verse 21 says submitting yourselves to what to one another in the fear of god and then he continues uh wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the lord for as verse 23 for the husband is the head of the wife even as christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body and so when i read that verse i kind of see okay well christ is the head of the church and uh, obviously he's the head of the church he's our savior he's our he's the he's um kind of the the root of that of our new family tree the uh the um the cornerstone but he he also is the overseer of the church he oversees the church looks out for the church uh as he does individual believers and you know it gets hebrews that says he's the overseer of our souls in the same way then we as husbands uh should be looking out for the best and overseeing uh, you know that for the welfare of our wives and our families of course but uh, all for our wives so the the husband and wife it's not like it, it it's not a power play it's a husbands ha, kind of have the role i believe it, uh, uh, in, in some sense of being the overseer um you know looking out for your wife for what what's best for her uh that you know knowing understanding that she may be weaker in certain aspects um again not talking about physically well certainly physically in general but often sometimes too emotionally uh, i think women are more sensitive that's i would consider that weakness per se but weakness in the sense of being more sensitive i think god get, has given females more emotional intellect uh whereas men can be pretty uh pretty obtuse sometimes about uh some things like that um and i think it's part of the reason why uh and i think that god designed us that way uh so you we better you know the husband and wife they're 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 completely compatible they're they're you know they they make each other whole essentially um and the in that sense uh you know obviously we should submit to our you know we shouldn't look at hus, husbands shouldn't see themselves as like you know uh in a in a, in a you know, overbearing with their wives and like it's my way or the highway it's not like that at all it's more of an overseeing role uh just as christ is not overbearing just how christ is not a, a dictator to us uh, but rather is he's out out looking always for our best interest uh that's how we should uh be not only to our wives and our relationship to our wives but also to one another as believers you know submitting ourselves to one another in the fear of god you know in the reverence of god for everything he's done for us being thankful like like you said earlier and um you know being thankful like you said just some of the it's amazing i i, I can say i'm the same way like you know like I can think of an even more simple example. Like, there's been times where I've been like deathly ill, and um, like you mentioned, just coming out of it and just having a glass of water is like the the most heavenly thing I could ever think of. You know, it's like so thankful that for that glass of water um, or a food, for example. So, yeah, I think it's important to uh, keep things in perspective. I yeah, I, I want to mention here. It doesn't say women submit to men. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. A lot of people have taken these verses out to say that all women are beneath all men. And if a man is present, he automatically leads because he's male. That's not what these are saying at all. Uh, to become one flesh in a marriage. And one of them has to be the head. You can't both have two. You can't have two heads. Uh, and so it's clear that the father the male is the head he shields the wife he is over the wife he protects the wife uh and the woman is under that protection and supports and lifts up her husband it doesn't mean he's trampling all over her and like he said uh my way or the highway it, that's not it at all as a matter of fact if you look at i don't know how many uh, real Jewish couples, you know, but I knew many old school Jewish couples out in LA and they, they are so good to their wives. I'm serious. They take the biblical, uh, uh, treatment of their wife very seriously. They use, uh, Rebecca as an example, you know, how Jacob, uh, loved her and I mean, Rachel, uh, and Rebecca and, um, they they live by this biblical principle so if you want to see it lived out I, i've seen it you know in person that they're not taking this to mean 
he lords over her and she, you know, like a lot of people put it. Right. And um, if, if more people would just be okay with that, there's one head and it's, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean he's better than you. It just means allow him to lead, allow him to be the shield, allow him to be protector, you know, allow him that God has set us up in these ways that it doesn't mean you're less than you're equally important. You're one flesh. How can one flesh have part of the flesh be more important than the other flesh? You just can't have two heads on one body. That's all. Just like the body of Christ has one head. It's Christ. And so I, I wanted to be clear because a lot of these verses that mention men and women, uh, such as Timothy, are about husbands and wives. And people take them as men and women in general to belittle women. And that is not the case at all. And a biblical marriage, if it's done properly, is a beautiful thing. It's just rarely ever done. And this is also another reason why you should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You can't trust he will be a proper spiritual head of the house. You can't trust that he will live by God's ways and be a proper leader. And so uh, one of the things is a, a godly husband uh, should love his wife like Christ loved the church and a godly wife should support and let the husband be the head. So uh, it works great if it's done properly. It's just unfortunately so many people do marry uh, unequally and it, and it, and it's very difficult. I've, you know, I, I, I see a lot of people that get saved after they're married, and it's very difficult on people. It really can be. Sure it is. That, that verse is the one that I really pay attention to. So submitting so yourselves one to another. Uh, you see there, equally in the mm -hmm. body of Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. We are not above each other. That that's like the the where most churches now have one or two people way lording over everybody else and what they say is the high or the highway. Like he said, there it's not a congregation anymore. It's just one guy over a bunch of people, and that is not the biblical uh, church that I see anyway. There were leaders in the biblical church, and then there were elders and deacons, and many of them, and then the rest of the congregation, but everybody was uh, equally important. They all had different roles and I, I didn't see them as lording over each other. There were leaders because there were some that were theologically more sound and held those positions, but they didn't lord over people. So submitting yourselves one to another, we are not above or below anyone. We are all one in Christ. Amen. And he's going to drive that point home in these next verses uh, where he says, um, Therefore, as the church is subject to, unto Christ, so let the wives be, their, be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for, uh, for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Um... Yeah, and I could continue here. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So again, another appeal to uh, spiritual purity and uh, moral purity. Again, we're supposed to be holy and separate, uh, separate. You know, in our lifestyle, we're not supposed to be walking in darkness like, like we once did. And that we we learn we learn that how to be that be that way and how to conduct ourselves that way, what God's will is by the washing of the word, which is to, to abide in that word and to allow it to apply it to yourself. Um, so again, you know, the, the, you know, just having the Bible and understanding it, uh, or having the Bible and reading it, but not understanding it, it's like a, kind of like a bar of soap that you never use, but um, you know, applying it to yourself, like, allow it to wash you know, and renew your mind, that's where real transformation occurs. 
Um, and it, it like it like like you said, uh, you know, Christ loved the church. He didn't. Uh, he you know he did, he's not like a, a you know a, a wife beater. He is he's a compassionate husband, and that's how we should be with our wives. Um, and we we all, we all have uh, different roles, of course, but um, but uh, it's not it's it's a, it's a it's a partnership, you know. It's we're really, uh, in fact, Paul uh, makes this clear is that we're really, you know, we could sh we should consider ourselves one flesh, uh, the wife and the husband and the wife are one flesh. So just as you wouldn't, uh, you know, uh, abuse your own body, uh, you wouldn't, you shouldn't be abusing your wife. Um, but I don't know if you have anything to say about those verses, or if you'd like to continue. Go ahead. Wait a minute. Do you, I sorry. I, you, I read. I read twenty four through uh, twenty seven. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, let me see. Yeah, he kind of the other two verses we just read. Right. And then he goes on to these, which are kind of explaining what those verses mean. Right. Uh, for the husband is the head of the wife, so he's saying why to do why you do this. This is why, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body did you guys get that the savior of the body that's the protective role i was talking about uh therefore as the church is subject unto christ as savior so let the wives be to their own husband uh let the wives be to their own husbands in everything husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it Again, self-sacrificially, that he might sanctify or make it holy and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Did you stop there? Yes. Actually, no, I, just, I read 27 as well. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word now it tells us in hebrews that we're sanctified by the offering of jesus's body by the blood it says the blood by which you were sanctified uh and so washing of water by the word uh is i've seen that term a couple of times i think it it goes into knowing god's word being filled with his word um and i think jesus himself as the word uh, and fulfilling all the prophetic in the word uh, that that entails everything, cleansing it. But this here sounds like a, a, I can't be perfectly certain if this is positional. I believe it is that he presented to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So. He, he did sanctify us by the blood. So this may be actually practical. What are you thinking here? Because Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I've been, yeah, I've been practical that. sanctification. The washing of the water by the word would be the written word, the spoken word. And this would apply to us doing these things. And, and these instructions to do these things would be practical sanctification. So that the church would be without blame. Yes, uh, it's fascinating you bring that up, and you and and you hit on something that I never picked out before. Because I've been studying these verses that refer to, uh, you know, spotless, wrinkle, without blemish. There's a number of verses like that, and it was clear to me that some are uh, positional and some are practical, as you mentioned, and. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. You pointed out that one refers to the blood. Obviously, if it's referring to the blood, that that is a positional. Uh, that's a positional uh, statement, and I, I totally agree that it is positional in Hebrews. And I agree that way right here it says about the word. It, it is. It, it almost does seem it gets practical because, um, like you said, these are. They, it, it's in the context of of doing or you know being being. Yeah. Don't walk in darkness anymore, uh, because you're not in that way anymore. Conduct yourselves, walk in the light, walk, you know, walk circumspectly, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense because the water of the word, again, that's what transforms our mind in, in a practical sense. Uh, 
so that you just gave me a huge uh i'm gonna study that out and see what look at that a little more carefully because that makes perfect sense that um uh, in hebrews it's, it's positional there's a, a there's a verse in colossians too that's uh often used by lord shippers where it says uh it's talking about uh if you continue in the word uh I think it's a Colossians two or, or maybe it's Colossians one twenty three. It's Colossians one twenty three, where people say, uh, "Lordship is trying to say, oh well, if you continue steadfast uh, until the end or something like that." Uh, oh yeah, 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 that is uh, that is they'll they'll be without they'll be blameless. Right in His sight, and I think yeah, the, in His yeah. sight there is not in, in eternal sense; it's in a right, yeah. right here and now sense. That's you right. I, yeah. I agree with you on that. Yeah, yep. so I've been studying that out. And what you mentioned about the word or the blood and the word, that's another data point that I can use to kind of, I, I, again, I've been just trying to figure those out and uh, you unlock something for me. So I'm very thankful for yeah, that. Yeah, that's the I've done that before. And, and I mentioned that it says without correction, without correction. That that section talks about how they would be, if they continue in this, they'll be without, I think it's uh, blameless and without correction or something. It's another word for correction, but ah, awesome. It, it's it like if you read that whole section, it's talking awesome, about, man. you know, if they do this, they'll be without correction. But um, yeah, I I think this may be a, a practical and positional. You might it, say yeah, it, it very well could be both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That he might he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify which he did with his blood and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Okay. Yeah, this is practical. So he sanctified it with his blood and then cleansed the church with the washing of water by the word. So it tells us this, this chapter is about what the Lord's will is. Right. His will is that we don't walk foolishly, but wise. And we do all these things he tells us. And it's his will that he cleanses it with the washing of water by the word. So his leaders uh, and the congregation can be cleansed by the word. It says, you know, the more uh, word we have in us, that's why uh, Peter says grow in grace through the milk of the word, uh, because that's where real change, change begins to take seed in us. You know, it's, it's a lot harder for me to do the things I used to do because I hear God's word in the back of my head. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, it's filled with it. Right. So I, I really do think this is practical. Wow. Uh, told, 11. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no you're right. Cause it says even in, in verse one, chapter five, therefore be imitators of God. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the whole chapter is really about, uh, you know, because again, Based on based on a past reality, based on this reality that you're no longer children of darkness, you've been cleansed, you've been washed, positionally, etc. Walk it out, um, and uh, you know, you know, do what's what's uh, fitting for saints. Don't do what's fitting for the the unsaved. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me uh, let's go and uh, I'll, I'll read the next uh, rest of this chapter and finish it up, and then we can comment on it. Is that okay? Or yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, verse twenty eight. So ought men, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherish, cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall no man, shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined with his wife. And they are, and the two shall be of one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, as the wife see that she reverence her husband. And again, one thing I think an amazing, uh, an amazing positional truth that I reflect on often. Is again remembering that you know in Adam when Ab and Eve ate of the garden, uh, they basically became married to the law. The law became one; their their flesh became governed essentially by the law, and no longer were they governed by the spirit. They, they didn't have the spirit. They they were governed by the flesh by the by the law. They became married with it. It became 
uh it, it, the the roman says that our body is um it's it's sin possessed it owns us uh in terms of as an unsaved person uh even even now as a believer our our flesh essentially is sin possessed um and you know it, it has its own dictates it has its own uh it, it's 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 like a spouse it's like it, it's it's like a uh 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 a, a spousal abuser i mean it it, it 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 it's like a drill sergeant it says you know drop and give me 50 and as an unsafe person you have no uh power to resist it or no reason to resist it really and so you 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 give in to all the dictates that that the sin uh you know demands and so that's why we needed to die to the law um and be married the, you know the law binds the law the law binds you it's like you know it's like the bars of a jail it, it binds you whereas a spirit is boundless and that's why when christ we're married uh we're we're no longer uh our flesh that's why we need to be circumcised of our flesh and be uh married to another and that another is the spirit and so we, we are one spirit with christ and so first corinthians 6 uh 13 through 15 says Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God b both raised up the Lord and will will raise us up by His power. Do you not know your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So our flesh, uh, governed by the law, uh, bound by the law, is dead to the law. Our body, our, 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 our flesh existence, our, our existence and Adam died with Christ so that we could be married to another, another, in which is the spirit. And that's what also Romans uh, 1 through 6 says. It says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion, or power, or authority, over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, again, our husband essentially was the law, if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, what if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another, another man. Therefore, my brethren, you who have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we are in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now that we have become delivered from the law, having de died to what we are held by, again, the law held us like there were the bars in a cage, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so when people, lordshippers, try to use the law against you, any law whatsoever, uh, they are using it unlawfully for the because Tim Paul says to Timothy that the law is good if someone uses it lawfully, but it's not for a righteous person. A believer is a right. righteous person, and so they're using it unlawfully. They're they're actually yep. sinning by using the law against you. Yep. So, uh, yep. I, I love I love those positional truths that we died to the law. We're no longer associated with whatsoever. We're we are go we are married to the spirit, and the law of the spirit says you will be raised again. That's a law of life. It's a law of liberty, not a bind of 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 being held back or are bound or condemned. That that's the, what the law does. Yeah, somebody was using that same verse uh, actually against us. Uh, Mike sent me the text saying she preaches lawlessness. Paul says we establish the law, and I'm thinking, does he know what establish means? It means we show the real standards of the law. As a matter of fact, Christians, we're held to a higher standard than just the dead letter. We're supposed to love them. Not only are we not supposed to hate the enemies, we're supposed to love them. That right. goes beyond the law. Right. That's We establish the law way up here. And we show you how, just like Jesus did, 
how high God's standard is. It's perfection. God's law demands perfection in our hearts, in our minds, in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. We establish the law. Uh, and, and he makes the mistake of thinking that because we tell you don't trust in yourself keeping the law to save you, that we're telling you to break the law. And it's they, they don't get it. Like, they, they And they have the same tired arguments. Sadly, people just, the natural man cannot receive the things of God. They're foolishness to him. And so they'll have every reason. Well, that would mean you're going to just live whatever you want. Well, apparently you think how you're living is getting you to heaven. All of these instructions in this chapter are to already saved people. You know, all of these epistles are to saved people. They're instructions on how we're supposed to live. And we're supposed to grow in that through the milk of the word. Like it says, the washing of water by the word. That's how we get better. So when it says, I, I love this part. When it says, so, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself again. We, we're one flesh, one, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it. Even the Lord is the church. He is our example. Jesus is our example, especially in marriage, because marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. That's why it was such a horrible thing to have divorce. God never wanted divorce. It was the shadow of Jesus and his church and his people. And to, to make a divorce is to defile that picture. But he said he gave it to them because out of the hardness of their own hearts. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined into his wife and the two shall be one flesh that's why all this you know uh a husband and wife should be considered like one person with one head that's why there's no fighting i'm the head no i'm the head but there, there's you're one person you can't be insulted if you're part of the person that's the head you get what i'm saying the head is the male but you and he are one. So this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. And again, the mystery here is how marriage is a picture of Jesus and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. So the a mystery here is that a marriage should reflect Jesus's love for the church and the church's submission to him as the head. And if we would all follow that and get out of our own flesh and our own egos, that would go a lot better. And I'm, I, and I'm not married. I'm talking about to each other within the church, you know, submitting ourselves one to another. This need to lord over people or to be greater than is just, it's really the wrong idea. And the, that's why the Catholic Church to me is so offensive to have this hierarchy that they've set up. I, it's just, it doesn't make sense because there's only one head and that's Jesus, you know, not the Pope. And it, it misses the, the point of it all, you know. So anyway, this, uh, chapter is interesting because it's it's all practical uh living right. uh right. commands you know instructions yep it's good exhortation we all need it to be reminded you know oh yeah uh -oh. oh i wanted to let the viewers know that gary wayne will be returning on january 7th on thursday night for a live stream on my channel i'll do uh, a video to remind everyone 
but he was uh, out on surgery and he had some complications and that's why we hadn't heard back from him. But uh, he will be joining us again to discuss the Genesis 6 conspiracy. He's the author of the Genesis 6 conspiracy. And if you haven't seen the first visit, just type in Gary Wayne on my channel and it's very interesting. Yeah, I have that book and I, I've gotten probably about a quarter of the way into it. Oh, and it's big. I, and I, yeah, it's big. It's a it's a tome and it's super fascinating. Uh it's just it's so dense. It's like it, it just one a paragraph a lot of times it's like it's just packed with information. And so it's something I want to read continue to read, but I always get distracted for some reason. Uh I have to pick it back up again. But I'm looking forward to that uh that interview. That was awesome. Um and Luke, if you're out there, we miss you like crazy. It's not the same without you. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm trusting you'll be back soon. And but take your time until you're you're completely recovered. We, we got it handled, but you are uh, missed. And uh, so I want you to know that uh, people. Uh, at, well, I'd say uh, if we could all uh, pray for him, continue to pray for him, uh, for his speedy recovery. Um, and with that. I think that we'll cover it tonight. Uh, I think uh, Steve, uh, the soldier, uh, his, his channel name is so, uh, Sol Soldier for Christ. We have a war. I believe we're having a program on his channel tomorrow. Uh, it usually starts around 7 or 8. Um, he'll put a reminder out. Um, but I'm expecting that he's going to have a program tomorrow. Uh, so if you're interested in that. And then we also have on Friday, the Fun Fellowship Friday, starting at 9.30. Uh, and with that, uh, as, as our brother Luke says, uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.